with you. All right. It's good to, good to see all your smiley faces today. I want to thank Pastor Dan and uh, Jason from the state convention for uh, covering the pulpit while I was gone. Her Pastor Dan had a really great message. I was actually watching it while I was in line for Space Mountain. And then I heard him say that whole thing and I was like, I, all right, he's good. It's good. Hey, we saw that camp video. I just want to say thanks so much for supporting our students and our elementary school kids. Hey, what an awesome week at camp they had. Congregation, can, can we just say First Baptist is about the next generation? Can we just say that? Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you for prioritizing our students as you have done for so many years. May we never stop giving up on the kids. Amen? Thank you again for your, what you've done for helping our kids attend camp this year. Go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, all right? And while you're finding that, Ephesians is in the New Testament, if you need a little bit of help there, about two-thirds of the way through the Bible. Hopefully you picked up a bulletin on, on your way in, you got an outline in there, you can follow along with me today, uh, or you can use your phone, scan that QR code in front of you and Follow along digitally with me. Today we are starting a brand new sermon series called, drum roll please, Frequently Asked Questions. And this is going to take us through the rest of the summer. From now through Labor Day, with the exception of one week, we'll be addressing questions that you have actually asked. Earlier this year we did a sermon series, you might remember this, called What Are You Thinking?, and uh, that generated a ton of questions in your conversations. And so I thought, hey, let's do a, a real special practical sermon series in the summertime as we go through and answer some of the questions that you guys have. So today and next week, we're going to tackle this question right here. How do I make great decisions? It's, it's, it needs two weeks in order for us to really tackle it. And when I, what I mean by this is, hey, folks, we get a lot of questions from you all, and we especially got a ton during COVID, but things like this, right? Should I move? Should I stay? Should I change jobs? Should I homeschool the kids? Should I put them back in public school? And, you know, should I get married? Where should I go to college? I mean, just the list goes on and on and on. And so my question to you today is this. How do you make decisions? Have you ever thought about that? And so we're just going to wait now until you all start sharing. <laughs> Honestly, but here's the scary thing, everybody, and I'm going to be honest here. The vast majority of people do not know how to make decisions good decisions. Now, I know we're in church today, so let's just get this on the table. As Christians, what do we do? We pray about them. Okay, excellent. Now, we're done with that, and that sounds really good, and it sounds really spiritual, but let's just be practical here. There's so much more to decision making than just praying through things. Obviously, the Bible tells us that God made us creatures of free will, right? God gave us a brain, and he wants us to use it, my mom used to say this to me. She would say, son, God gave you a brain. Use your head for something other than a hat rack. That's what my mom used to say to me all the time because I always wore baseball caps and look what it did to me. Yep. Maybe that wasn't a good decision, right? <laughs> so when it comes to making great decisions, here's what we don't want to do. Let's have some fun together. You don't want to go and talk to this person right here. Right? 
This would not be very helpful. And if you grew up in the 1980s like I did, which was the best decade that has ever happened in the history of our world, okay? I heard that amen over there. You know that the Zoltar machine was in Tom Hanks' 1988 movie, Big. And we all know how that turned out, right? So whether if it's at the carnival or if you go to San Francisco and you go to Pier 39, one of these things is sitting out there, right? I took a picture with it one time, right? But the, the, the truth is, is you don't need this guy to help you make a great decision. Um, but what the reality is, though, is so many people, they really don't go to the Zoltar machine. What so many people do is they consult the Internet, and they go to Mr. Google, or they ask Miss Siri, or... For those of you guys who are current and today, they go to Mr. Chat GPT. Now, if you don't know what that is, we're talking about artificial intelligence. Seriously, this happens. That's the world we're living in, folks. And for whatever reason, though, people just trust everything that they get on the internet, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, a lot of people do because they keep consulting. And so you have Google and Siri and Chat GPT, and these things they generate a plethora of responses when you ask them, How do I make a great decision? And honestly, some of the answers that you would get from there are actually not too bad. But most of the responses that you will read, here's the problem they come from a belief system that is actually contrary to Scripture. Why is that? Well, because they are human made. But the responses that we read, they make sense to us, and sometimes they even sound great. And if we're not careful, we won't even notice that they are coming from a position that is contrary to Scripture. Now, track with me a little bit. Scripture over and over says this. We are to put God in place number one. We're to do what he says. And unfortunately... Most of the logic and philosophy that you will read on the internet does not put God in place number one, okay? Instead, what they put in place number one is self, humanity. And see, whenever we follow ideas that are not of God, it almost always will lead to a place that is not so good. And folks, this sort of thing happens all the time. And we've actually talked about this before. We can rationalize and justify just about anything that our minds can come up with. The twin sisters, right? Rationalization and justification. And so we have to be very careful because the Bible actually says in Jeremiah 17 verse 9 that the heart is deceitful above all things and it is desperately wicked. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think I trust somebody who's coming up with something whose heart is desperately wicked. That's why it's so incredibly important that at the foundation of all things, we know and we understand what God says. And then we use our brain that he gave us to make great choices and then be a champion steward of the life that he has given us. So with that in mind, what does God say about decision making? Well, I'm really glad you asked that question. So Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verses 15 through 17, let's read it together. He says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish but understand what the Lord's will is. So here we have in these verses, God pleading with us as believers to use our noggins, right? We're to be very careful as we walk through life. We're not to be foolish in our decision making. We need to make the most of every opportunity that comes our way. And he even tells us right here why that's important. Because the days are evil. And you don't have to look too far outside of this room to see the truth in those verses, do you? 
The days were evil in history when the Apostle Paul was writing this to the church in Ephesus, and things are evil today. For those of you who have lived longer than a week and a half, you know that our value system in our own culture has reached a point of insanity, where people think up is down and down is up and left is right and right is left and inside is out and outside is in. It's crazy out there. And you know what? It actually is all part of Scripture. And so here we are, we're God's people, and we are called to be level-headed and to use wisdom in our day-to-day decision-making. So with all the different opinions out there that you read on the internet and advice you get from people and how to make a great decision, I just come back to that question I asked you earlier is, how do you make great decisions? And if you're having to ask the internet on how do I make a great decision, if we could just be honest, what that really means is you don't know how to make a great decision. Because it's not about the issue at hand. In other words, should I move? Should I stay? Should I buy? Should I sell? Should I rent? Should I take my kids out of public school, put them in homeschool? I mean, the list goes on and on and on. It's not about that question at all. It's about the process. That is the concern at hand. So how do you arrive at the conclusions in your life when you have to make a decision? And see, God wants us to use wisdom as we go through that process. You with me this morning, congregation? All right. So with that being said, to help you today, let's go on a little bit of a journey. There are two considerations that we need to consider, and you see in your outline, about making decisions. Letter A is this. There are certain rules to follow in any given area of life. The more we know them, the better chance we will have to make a great decision. So like in mathematics, there's rules and principles that we have to follow, right? In English, there are rules and principles that we have to follow. In engineering, in music, there are rules in a given area, whatever it is that we have to follow. We need to know them in order to make great decisions. Now, to help illustrate this truth, I'm going to put up a picture here of three different professionals. Okay, let's put them up there. So here's a picture of a doctor, a lawyer, and a mechanic. So play along with me this morning, church. If I'm not feeling very well and I have a cough, who am I going to go see? Somebody said over here, the lawyer. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Okay. No, I'm going to go see the doctor, right? Okay. Now, if you have an issue with real estate or taxes or wills or trusts, who are you going to go see? Are you going to go see the mechanic? Hey, Mr. Mechanic Man, I need some help putting a will and a trust together for my family. Do you think you can help me out? Are you going to go him? No. You're going to go to the attorney, and specifically, you're going to go see an attorney who specializes in wills and trusts in that given field. If you have car problems, are you going to go see the medical doctor? Somebody back there's nodding their head. (laughs) No, you're going to go see the mechanic. All that to say is you agree with letter A. In any given area of life, there are certain rules and principles. And the more that you know about the given rule or the given area, the, the better your chances are that you're going to make a great decision. Letter B in your outline. Being aware of or knowing the rules of a given area is still not enough. Here's why. Because knowledge in this area still doesn't make the decision for you. You have to still act. But knowledge of the area will give you some clarity on what to do and where to go next. For example, in me and my life, you may not know this, but I'm actually a pretty good auto mechanic. I've worked on cars a lot when I was younger and before I had a bad back. And if you brought your car to me and you said, Pastor Wayne, my car won't start. I would say, hey, pop the hood, put the key in the ignition, and let's hear it. Now, if you've worked on cars, this will make sense to you. If the key goes in, and you turn it over, and it goes click, 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 knowledge says that's potential problem A. If you put the key in, you click it over, and it goes room, 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 potential problem B. So a little bit of knowledge helps you know what could or could not be 
the problem. And so the mechanic here, the mechanic's knowledge is going to help him. Now, his knowledge alone isn't going to fix the problem. He actually has to go get the parts and do the labor. And so in our lives, when we ignore or don't pay attention to the rules, and in this case, if we don't like what Mr. Mechanic says, and he says, oh, it's the battery or it's the starter or whatever the case may be, if we say, no, 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 I don't like that. No, I think what the problem is is that there's not enough air in the spare tire. And some people out there are really that stubborn, all right? And if that's the case, who's going to suffer the consequences of that decision? We are. You. And your car is still not going to get fixed. And so when we ignore the wisdom of somebody who knows, then eventually it's going to cost us. Whether it be physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, whatever it is, whether it's willfully ignoring or just being naive, and we'll talk about that in a few weeks, there's still a cost. So church, can you think back of a time in your life where you willfully ignored a principle or a rule in a given area? Maybe you were just unfortunately naive, whatever, and it cost you. Maybe it cost you greatly, and you suffered some consequences. I think most of us can go there pretty quickly. And that's why it's just so important that we recognize that just knowing the rules and the principles is still not enough. For many of us, we're smart people. We've got some life experiences. We know the rules, and we know the principles in a lot of different areas. But the truth is, even if we know the rules, that doesn't mean we actually follow them. We don't actually do them. Happens all the time, doesn't it? It does. For example, the doctor tells you to do this, and we don't do it, right? I know I'm poking on you a little bit, but we've all been there. Scripture says, use wisdom as you walk through life. Because God wants us to make great decisions. And in order to do that, we must know the rules and the principles that he's given us. So in order to make great decisions, number one in your outline, we must submit to the rules, okay? It's not enough just to know the rules. We actually have to submit to them and do them. Again, we're talking about the process here. This is part of that be very careful how we live, not as unwise, but as wise. If you've ever had a surgical procedure, you know that before doctors go into surgery, There are rules and procedures that they must follow. There's a whole manual out there about hand washing before surgery, okay? So you know, you've seen it on TV. The doctors go in, and they get in, they turn the water on, and they start scrubbing up, all right? And they do all this, right? Did you know that there is actually uh, in the rules that doctors have to scrub for a certain amount of time? Then they actually have to remove their wedding rings and their jewelry and their watches and all the stuff. Then the water temperature actually has to be a certain temperature, right? And then there's even a certain way that they have to rinse their hands, right? And then they have to raise their hands up. You've seen this before they walk into the surgery room and get their gloves on and any other surgery equipment that they have to be wearing. So here's the point. It's not enough for the doctors to just know those rules and procedures. They actually have to obey them. Could you imagine if your loved one was going in for surgery tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. And, uh, and, and the doctor goes in and scrubs up and you're there talking to him while he's scrubbing up. And then he you know, rinses and just kind of flicks the water off and then does one of these things. <laughs> okay, I'm all good to go. <laughs> you going to feel good about that? I'm kind of thinking not, right? Knowing the rules isn't enough. We must submit to them and follow them. You with me so far? And so we've had all these moments in our lives where, where either you know the person or maybe it's you, and we think back and reflect on an instance, and then we say, how in the world... Did they, or we, or me, 
make that decision. What was I thinking? How did I think that was a good idea? And the answer is, they were unskilled in how to make a great decision. Because see, whether it's you or the other person, those people actually think in real time that the decision that they're going to make is an incredibly great idea. So whether it's should I move, should I sell, should I buy, should I rent, should I retire, should I put my kids in school here or there, keep them home, whatever it is, these decisions, they end up getting made in a vacuum. They believe that it was a one-off decision and that it was isolated from the rest of life. And congregation, it's not. Now, Michaela, would you get me my tool over here for me, please? I got my handy-dandy assistant to bring in my prop for the day, all right? So she's bringing it to me. Thank you. Appreciate that. This is a bicycle wheel. Now, some of you might remember I used this back in January. And this illustration proves what I'm trying to say here. It's okay. In the center of this bicycle wheel is the hub right here, okay? Okay. And when Jesus is the center of your life, it brings stability, it brings connectivity, it brings trueness to all of these other areas that the spokes represent. If I were to remove the hub, if I were to remove this, then all of these spokes would just dangle all over the place. And you wouldn't have any stability and it would not be true. The same is correct in our own lives, okay? When you remove Jesus, your life is just going to flip-flop, flangle, and dangle all over the place, and you're not going to have any trueness. And congregation, you will struggle, 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 struggle. So what do we do? We tend to focus on the one decision. Do I stay? Do I move? Do I rent? Do I do this? Do this? Get married? Go to college? Whatever it's going to be. Because we believe that the one decision is isolated from the rest of the tire. And folks, it's not. Reality is, it's actually not even possible to make a great decision in life in isolation. Every decision that we make is connected to the other areas of our life. We have to be mindful on this because if we don't get this part right, all the rest of it's going to be meaningless. You with me on that? Okay. Just like the surgeon, knowing the procedures, knowing what to do right before surgery is different than following them. The same thing is true with Jesus. If Christ isn't your hub, the other parts of your life aren't going to be good either. You can't just know that Jesus is Lord and that you have to accept him in your heart to go to heaven. Just knowing that is completely different than accepting Christ into your life, right? I've said this before. Going to church makes you a Christian as much as going down the street to McDonald's makes you a hamburger, okay? Having Christ at the center of your life affects everything else in your life going on. Do you understand that? Okay, so I don't want you to buy into all this malarkey that's going out there in the world that each individual independent decision is actually a one-off isolated independent decision because it's not. And our verse in Ephesians 5 today says, don't be foolish. And we'll see this in a few weeks, but the biblical fool actually believes that the single decision is isolated from the rest of life. The biblical fool believes that what I did last night has nothing to do with my marriage five years from now. The wise person recognizes that how I acted, how I responded, what I did affects my life today, tomorrow, next week, next year, five years from now, et cetera, et cetera. So in your outline, think about this. Your decisions determine your direction, and your direction determines your destination. So if I'm out here on the freeway and I'm driving on I-80 East and I say, man, family, we're on our way to San Diego. 
I'm heading in the wrong direction, aren't I? Mm-hmm. And if I'm on I-5 South, and if I'm telling my family, we are on our way to Salt Lake City. I don't know why anybody wants to go to Salt Lake City. But if you're on our way to Reno or Salt Lake City, we're going in the wrong direction. And your direction determines where you will ultimately end up. So grab a hold of this congregation. Your direction is determined by your decisions in life. So the decisions that you make, they're not one-off. They're not isolated. They're connected. Decision A is connected to decision B and so forth on down the line. And so when you make a decision, understand, it will send you, it will send your family into a certain direction. And that's why it's so important that we know the rules, we know the procedures of a given area in life. Are you with me, everybody? Okay, I know that was a long journey, but it's important. Number two in your outline. We have to be willing to submit to God. And I see this all the time, and so do you. We see this not just with unbelievers, but we see it with church folks. When it comes to making life decisions, we're often not submitting to God. Here's what's interesting. You see this in your outline. It's kind of a brain teaser, but we're often willing to submit to the man-made rules, but we're not willing to submit to the God who made the men, who made the rules that I submit to. And I'm sorry for the little typo there, okay? Just put the apostrophe there and we're, all right? So my hunch is, is when you drove to church this morning, you submitted to some man-made rules, like how fast you can drive down the road. I mean, out here on San Juan Avenue, everybody knows the speed limit's 75, Okay, no problem. I mean, you, nobody does 40 to 50, 45 out there. I mean, nobody does 40 to 45. I see you driving out there and you're not doing 40 to 40. Well, some of you are. Some of you are doing 30. <laughs> but nobody does 40. To, I mean, how old school is that, right? I'm just playing. When the light is green down the street here at Winding Way, what do you do when it's green? You, you go. Okay, everybody playing along. When the light is red, you when the light's red, you, okay, let's, we'll try this a little harder. When the light is yellow, what do you do, you? <laughs> See how excited you guys are? Yeah, when the light's yellow, you close your eyes, take your hands off the wheel, and floor the gas pedal, right? You know how it is, and if you're interested in getting driving lessons from me, okay, my name is Kevin Hunnell, and... Uh, I'll be happy to teach your kids. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But in all seriousness, when the light turns yellow, you know, you're supposed to prepare to stop. The guy over here is like telling me like, no, I don't, yeah. All right. So we submit to the man-made rules, and we do it all day long. But when it comes to the rules that God gives us, all of a sudden we hit the brakes, Don't we do that? We do. In fact, we sometimes consciously or, or subconsciously, we say, God, you just take care of all the big stuff out there. I'll handle all the details. And then we make decisions and we end up in the ditch. And then the people who love us say, how did you make that decision? What made you think that was a good idea? But for you at the time, it seemed like it was a wonderful idea. This happens all the time. In fact, what you actually did is you listened to your friends out there or the internet or chat GDP, and you followed the advice that they gave you. What you actually did is you followed your heart, which is a terrible idea. Okay? You forgot what God said and ignored what he said in Jeremiah 17, 9. Your heart is corrupt, and it will always lead you astray. You didn't pay attention to that truth, and you ended up in the ditch. That's exactly what happens to us, folks. And so King Solomon knows about this truth. And that's exactly why King Solomon wrote the next scripture in our outline. So I want you to go in your Bibles now to the Old Testament, to the book of Ecclesiastes. Look with me at chapter 2. It's 
scripture is also in your outline. King Solomon is said to have been the wisest person to have ever lived next to Jesus. So here's King Solomon. Here's what he says to us. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 10. He says, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. In other words, here's what he's saying. Go for it, big guy. He says, I had the money, so I did it. And there wasn't anything off limits. I was willing to follow my heart. I know about all the rules that God said and what he established, but I did what I wanted to do, and I did it my way. Like Frank Sinatra, right? And the verse goes on, and it says, And I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all of my labor, and this was the reward for my toil. Now skip down to verse 17. A few verses later, here is what he next says. So I hated my life. In other words, the light bulb came on, and he's realizing what all of his wild living brought him. Problems. By ignoring all of the rules and the principles for life that God had established, it brought him to a place where he says, I hated life. Maybe you've been there too, right? And so he goes on here and explains why he feels the way that he feels. Here's what he says. He says, because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. I didn't follow God, he says. All of it is meaningless. In other words, I was foolish and stupid. And he closes it with a chasing after the wind. Now, if you don't know what a chasing after the wind is, let's just imagine you and me, our families, we're at the park, we're eating a nice picnic, and we look over to the east, and we see a wonderful person doing this. We're going to grab our cell phones. We're going to make a little phone call. 911, what's your emergency? Um, there's a dude doing this thing. And we're going to be like, that guy's crazy. Because chasing after the wind is crazy. And you don't want to be that guy, do you? No. So the principle that God is teaching us here in his word, congregation, is this. Don't ignore my principles and rules. Otherwise, you're not going to like where you end up. Life's going to be messy. Because it's not about the one decision. It's not one off. It's about the process. It's about how you make decision. This is what matters. So let's look at that. Turn with me now to Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9, starting with me in verse 8. It's in your outline. Here's what it says. It says, do not rebuke. Now that means correct. He says, do not rebuke mockers. And if you don't know what a mocker is, a mocker is a fool. A fool doesn't understand that decisions are connected to each other, okay? A fool thinks that all the spokes on that wheel are just one-offs. And he says, do not rebuke mockers or they will hate you. My grandmother used to say when I was younger, she would say, a fool would argue with a fence post. That's what she said. Do not rebuke mockers or they hate you. Rebuke the wise now. Now a wise person gets it. They understand that decisions are connected to each other. And it emanates out of the hub of Christ Jesus at the center. It says rebuke the wise and they will what church? They will, lo well, say that again. They will love you. Verse 9, instruct the wise and they will be wiser still. Teach the righteous and they will add to their learning. Sound like the kind of person you want to be? Does that sound like what you want for your loved ones? Now verse 10. 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Verse 11, for through wisdom your days will be many and years will be added to your life. If you are wise, your wisdom will reward you. If you are a mocker, you alone will, say it together, suffer. So number three in your outline. Understand what leads to wisdom. And we see here exactly what God says is the beginning of wisdom. Back to verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Now this may challenge some of you a little bit. But when we start our prayers by asking God for wisdom in a decision, hit the brakes. That's the wrong place to start. Wait, wait, wait. What, What, Pastor Wayne? What? Say that again? Run that by me again? Yes, it's the wrong place to start. Hear me out, church. First, We must start at a place where we recognize who God is. And second, we must have the reverence for who he is. That is the fear of the Lord that Proverbs is speaking of. That is the beginning of wisdom. Not that you're scared of who God is, but that you're in amazement and awe of who he is. Think about the Israelites in Exodus 14, chapter, chapter 14, verse 31. When the Lord showed his power against the Egyptians, the Israelites feared the Lord. And then they put their trust in him. So you see in your bullet points here, wisdom begins with the recognition of who God is. If we don't have this recognition, Hear me out, church. It cannot and will not lead to wisdom from God. God has established this requirement. Then the second bullet point, recognition leads to reverence, which leads to submission. So first we have the recognition component. Next we add the reverence component. And when both are present, you won't be able to help but fall on your knees in complete aweness of God. Because he is holy, he is righteous, he is supreme above all. And he is glorious and he is wonderful. He is the Lord God. And the Lord God is not just another one of your card game playing buddies. He is the creator of the universe. And when you understand that, you will have a holy fear of him. That, my friends, is the beginning of wisdom, and that leads to submission. And you see the third bullet point there. Submission is not about what God asks of us. Do this, don't do that. No, 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 no. It's about who he is. So before you make a decision, are you in awe of who God is? Do you have recognition and reverence? And now is your will in submission to him? My hunch is for most of us that we don't stop long enough to go there. We're too busy in our lives. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so if you want to make great and wise decisions in your life, congregation, these components cannot be overlooked. Not that just God is big and that he's amazing and mighty, but that you want to be so obedient to what he says in his word because you honor him and you respect him as the Lord of life. So let's go back to our surgeon friend. It's not enough for him to follow or to know, I'm sorry, it's not enough for him to know what the manual says to prepare for surgery. The surgeon also has to respect those rules, not because they're there, but he must actually do what they say for the uh, sake of his patient and his license to perform surgery. We too must follow God's ways 
for the benefit of our own lives and so that we don't endure painful consequences. You know all those consequences that you look back on your life and you're like, yikes. Imagine what would have been the different story had you obeyed God. Look at verse 12. It says, if you are wise, your wisdom will reward you. If you are a mocker, you alone will suffer. So here we go, church, as we conclude. Now, none of us does this, right? Nobody gets up in the morning and says, man, when I get old one day, because you know, none of us are old yet. We're still all young. None of us say, when, man, one day when I get old, I really hope that my life is a total disaster. Nobody does that. Nobody says, I hope there's carnage all over the place and that I have all kinds of busted relationships. I hope none of my family wants to talk with me and I hope my life is a complete financial mess. That's my goal. Yeah, nobody does that. Everybody wants to be blessed. Everyone desires a good family life. Everyone wants a solid network of friends. Everybody wants emotional, mental, spiritual, hopefully physical health. People want God to bless them. Is that you? Is that you, congregation? If you want God's blessing, you gotta do what scripture says. We're gunning for God's blessing in our life. We must be obedient. And the pathway to reach that goal is, hear me, wisdom. And there are certain rules and principles that we must know, we must follow to make those great decisions. The beginning of wisdom says, God, regardless of the question at hand, I'm willing to be obedient and say yes to you. And scripture says right here in this verse that if we're wise, God will bless us if we follow what he says. If we recognize who he is, if we give reverence to him, if we obey his word, you will be blessed. What you have to decide now, congregation, in your life, are you gonna submit to the rules and to the principles that God has established and are you going to uh, submit to the rules of all the areas of life? The choice is yours. Are you going to follow them? Or are you going to ignore them and rebel against them? My prayer for you this morning is that with humility you would come today to the Lord and offer your mind and your, and your body and your spirit to him that you would confess your sins to the Lord and own up to the crazy choices that you've made in your past. And then with reverence and recognition of who God is, that you would submit your will to him and allow the Lord to work in your life from this day, July 16th, 2023, until he calls you home. I wanna pray that you have the desire to obey his word so that you can be blessed and rewarded as his word says. I know that's what you really want. You know that's what you really want. And it's what God wants for you as well, everybody. Honestly, it's what you need. So I just want to encourage you. Choose God today. I'm going to ask that you stand and pray with me this morning. Father, thank you so much for your goodness, for your grace, for your love in our life. And God, thank you so much that you care about us, so much that you want us to know about how life works and that you want us to be wise in our decision making. So God, thank you so much for your word and how it gives us guidance to navigate the crazy parts of life. Lord, we recognize that as love and care from you. So Father, as we're here this morning, we wanna bring that recognition and that reverence right back to you and say thank you, God, for being who you are. Your holiness blows us away, God. 
We recognize that you are God of gods and that you are the first and the last, the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end. And so God, as we're here today, we just wanna submit our will to you humbly right now in this place. We submit to you, God. So as we worship you, Lord, we ask now that you fill our hearts, fill our minds, fill our spirit with faith now, God, as we lift you up and we recognize your holiness today. Guide us into your presence, Lord God. Help us to see you for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship.